Hello and welcome to Jung at Harp. Today we are going to talk about how do you share the gift of yourself. I'm Deborah Henson Conant. I'm a composer and a performer, and I am here with Kathleen Wiley, who is a Jungian psychoanalyst, and we both play the harp, and therefore we call this Jung at Harp. So Kathleen, we started talking about this because we were talking about that this is the holiday season, and um, and the difference between sharing a gift that you uh, think someone's going to like, but maybe you're hiding yourself a little bit versus a gift where you really share yourself. And this came up because I just made a class in how to make your own video holiday card. And it is all about taking the talent that you have, not, not making the talent that you have, taking the skills that you have, no matter what level they are, the creative skills that you have and your desire to reach out and connect and putting them together in a certain way in order to be able to create a video greeting card. And we were talking about, and I can show you what that's like in a sec, but um, we were talking about how that can be both, that, how that's vulnerable and how sometimes we will try to hide ourselves in the gifts that we give. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what, what would you like to say about that? Well, you know, I think it's, I, I love when we came up with that really what we want to say to everybody who's watching and to ourselves is this holiday season, let's give the gift of ourself. Let's give the gift of ourself wherever we are, however we are. And when it comes to the musical greeting cards, Let's know that what's most important isn't going to be whether we play a complicated song or a simple song, or we have um, profoundly um, amazing poetic words, right. but then what matters is do we really show up with our being, with our head, heart, and gut all there at the same time to be able to say something that's genuine, something that's authentic through and through, and knowing we can do that with our musical instrument, no matter what our skill level. Well, yes. And let, let me show, I'd like to show that. And I'd also like to point out that we can do it whether we have an instrument or not. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I realized is that when you were first saying, um, uh, share the gift of ourselves, and I realized that that could come across to some people as a sacrifice. We need to sacrifice. We need to, you know, whatever that could be. And I realized one of the things that I love about this particular project is that you actually build your own creativity as you are learning to reach out to other people. And I just love the, the two sides of that, that, that people know. So, but let me just show you, you know, what it's like. And then let me show you what it could be like to do it even without an instrument. So it has, um, whoops, I just accidentally turned my mic, my amp off instead of on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it has to do with, you know, hitting the record button, really looking in the camera and saying, saying, and saying, Sylvia, I so wish that I could be with you this holiday season, and I can't. So I'm sharing a, a little song that I just learned. Mm -hmm and then grounding and then flourishing so that you're experiencing the ground and you're experiencing the flourishing. And then you can play a simple song or a complicated. Uh... You don't even have to play the right notes if you can't. So you use very some you it, it's really about connecting and it's about taking the time to go from that connection to this connection it's about connecting with the music and your instrument and it's about experiencing the feeling of freedom 
this is something anybody, whether they played the harp or not, could do. And it lets the instrument sing. Then you put in whatever you can do, even if it's... I mean, if that's all you can do, that's what you do. And then at the end, you put this other fancy thing in, which is really easy. And it lets you just really connect. If you're, an, if you're an advanced player, you can put all kinds of you know stuff in, it doesn't matter. But what, what you and I talked about is, this is not about showing your talent. It is the antithesis of American Idol. Right. It is the, the is opposite of trying to make a viral video. It is making one video for one person that's short and that's easy and that the more you do it, the more you're connecting. And, and I just wanted to show that, you know, it has nothing to do with, with, with playing uh, 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 the harp. I mean, you could, <clears throat> looking for something here, here's a pair of glasses. I mean, you can say, um, Joe, I can't be with you this holiday season and I don't play an instrument. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to play a little song on, on this pair of glasses. <laughs> and it goes like this. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh, o'er the wheels we go, dashing all the way. Ah! Bells on bells till then, right in through it bright. A phone and then the last and thing I sang song tonight. Oh, oh jingle bell, I mean, whatever you have to do, but you can take anything that you have, and you can play with it, and. And what I love about this, and I did this for Valentine's Day last year, and it was it was so fun because each one of them was so simple. And then I got more and more. I was like, oh, I have an idea here. I'm going to write down. I'm going to write down something down. And I'm going to put it in my mouth and take it out of my mouth. Like, I mean, I just kept having all these ideas, and it was fun. It was like being a kid. It was like playing with others. And I was teaching this in a class, and I want to hear what you have to say in a second, but I'm so excited about this. <laughs> I was teaching this in a class, and I was teaching um, a Hanukkah song, and right we took a break in the class, and one of the students sent a card off in the break in the class mm -hmm. to her sister-in-law, who was so moved by it. And I was like, you know, I have these ideas like, yes, this is going to work, you know, <laughs> and then someone does it, and it does work. And it's, it's, uh... yeah, but you know what I was thinking about um, as you were do, as you were sharing, particularly with the glasses, it is letting that childlike spontaneity, that creativity just flow. And that is so where we find our authentic self at times, you know, and I'm thinking about even whatever our skill level at the instrument we play, if we approached it with a childlike spirit, the difference it would make and our experience and what would come through because we'd automatically know that the right notes or the exact timing and rhythm really weren't the most important things for our holiday gift cards. But, you know, Think about the works of art your mother may have passed, kept on until she died. And then here you are at 55 having to say, what do I do with this? She, what do I do with this snowman I gave her and at five years old? Or, you know, we, we, I mean, things are valuable all throughout our life, not because they're works of art, but because again, they express who we are and the connection we have with someone. And that's what I think you're getting at with the individual holiday greeting cards is that are musical, is that you let this be something just like you were writing it by your hand, it would be specific to each person, right. you know, that you make it specific to each person, but part of the instrument is not just your voice and the written word, but it's the voice and the spoken word and the, and the word that comes through the music. Yeah, um, I, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, wow, what is, 
what is how do we become childlike and 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 also the experience that i had when i did these on valentine's day is and i just noticed it just now like when i first played it i was like well i'm going to play silent night and it's going to have all the right notes to the melody and then and then but it's not i mean that is just not my forte and i noticed that as i continued to make these um, one after another one. And one of the things that I teach in the class is how to set up your system so that you can make one after the other, so that you're not there crafting some, you know, like, here's my thing, you know, you, you do them one after another so that you do develop your creativity and you do develop the comfort of like speaking right in the camera to talk mm -hmm. to people. And it was just really so interesting to watch my own creativity expand by doing the same thing over and over and over again. And part of my brain was like, oh, I'm gonna redo the first one because I now I know how to do it better. And the other one was like, please just don't, just <laughs> go on, <laughs> keep going and then do it again, you know, in the holidays and then do it again for next Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh. So this, this, this idea of, of the gift of ourselves Mm -hmm. requires us to be willing to step into some vulnerability. And what's also beautiful is that it, it comes back to us, not only in somebody saying, oh, I really loved what you sent, right. but it's coming back in the moment. The expression itself mm -hmm. is giving us a deeper experience of ourselves from which we can give more. Absolutely. And you know, you mentioned that some people might get the idea that giving ourselves means sacrificing ourselves. And that is so far from the truth of what we're talking about. Because the only thing that gets sacrificed when we give ourselves are our facades, <laughs> our ego ideals of who we think we are, our pretenses. You know, those are the things that are sacrificed. And the other thing we've talked about in the last two or three weeks is how do we protect ourselves? Mm -hmm. So the other thing to know is that not everybody is going to value us. And that's just, unfortunately, the sad reality of the world we live in. People still are so caught in their own facades mm -hmm. and their own personas that they're exacting, judgmental, their own internal perfectionism gets projected onto somebody else. Their own lack of self-acceptance gets projected out onto somebody else. So I think it is important to realize that whenever we offer a gift of ourself, whether or not the other person accepts it or how they respond to it has nothing to do with our value. Well, that's so, about them. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Because you, I've talked about this before. There have been times in my life when I shared something and the reaction, um, often a, a kind of subtle reaction, like someone being like, you know, that, has just shut me down mm -hmm. for decade, a decade um, when it came to a particular um, sort, of, sort of a piece of music. And, um, and so that didn't get shared at all. And I, and, and, and I would start sort of hiding through music because you, you can hide through performance just like you can share through performance. So what are all the things that people can do? I mean, first of all, understanding that no matter what somebody else says, you're building your creative muscle by doing this. And I mean, this is one of the things that is so important about the closed community of Hip Harp Academy mm -hmm. is that the, it, there, there is none of, there's none of that. The, the, everybody's working on the same thing, which is being creative and sharing themselves. And they're all trained to look at what someone is trying to do and then help them find a, 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 a way to do that, that that's going to be more effective, but not at looking at stuff in a, in a critiquing way mm -hmm. but you're right other people are going to do that so what do we do when that happens we breathe deep and we imagine that there's a mirror in front of us that is facing towards them and it just reflects it right back to them we're not going to take it in 
And I think that visualization can be very helpful for keeping us from getting caught in someone else's judgments. Because the truth is, the only reason that your whoever did the for your piece of music had any power is there was a big old vat of energy in you that was already doing it. Right, exactly. So yes. All she did was triggered it. Right. So if if criticism comes towards you for your musical Christmas card and you find yourself all of a sudden devaluing self, then say, thank you, great creator and divine essence in me for giving me this opportunity to see this judgmental, critical, demeaning, killing energy in me and help me begin to understand it and know where it's rooted and to be able to dance with it so it can learn a new way of moving. Because that's really where our immunity is to other people's judgments and criticisms. Because it's always going to be there. That's just, again, unfortunately, it's, it's still the state of where most people live in terms of their consciousness or lack of. You know, one of the things I love about what you just said is that uh, I remember the, the old Pogo cartoon, we have met the enemy and they is us. Yes. Um, I don't know if exactly that's what the terminology was, but anyway, um, here, now I was worried that somebody was going to be like, you said you quoted Pogo incorrectly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's how I hear it. Um, that this is an opportunity when we see criticism, it's an opportunity for us to actually, or when we respond to it, when we, when we realize that we're being triggered by it, an opportunity for us to actually see it externally where we can start to engage differently and make choices versus where it lives right now, which is inside us without, often without words or with just the no, 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 that we can't really shut off. So this is great, Kathleen, I love this. So this means that sharing yourself not only lets you share with other people, not only develops your creativity, also gives you the opportunity to start being able to see the see w where is that voice in us by seeing it seeing where we see it in others absolutely i mean one of the gifts of relationship is that whatever we see coming back at us gives us an opportunity to see that in ourselves too often though we keep blaming the other person it's about them but if we realize okay where is this in me and we we take it up in us then again that is that is our protection that is where we gain immunity and i want to say about pogo for those of you who don't know walt kelly was a cartoonist in the 50s right a dhc so. if john is watching if he were here he could tell us exactly he has all the pogo cartoon books <laughs> and so pogo is a little possum who lives in the swamp with all of oki pinoki swamp i believe is that right with all of his animal friends and he and albert the alligator are walking through the swamp one day and seeing all this pollution and pogo says we've done seeing the enemy and it is us that we are the ones who really do pollute ourselves and now we're talking about it symbolically and internally we pollute ourselves with our criticisms and our judgments and our perfectionisms and our um our degrading and our demeaning and so when we begin to realize that and say whoa 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 all of those things keep me from seeing the beauty of what is here already and seeing the excellence of who we are. I mean, that is what perfectionism prevents. Perfectionism prevents us from owning our own excellence. I'm really taken with your description of this as polluting. Mm -hmm. and, and in part because I understand from nature that when you stop polluting, nature, uh, nature recovers. Yeah because that is its natural state to recover. And so that implies to me that if we're polluting ourselves with all the things that you just mentioned, the, and the perfectionism comes up so often, mm -hmm. uh, along with self-criticism, um, they seem to go together. Um, 
And if we can make any headway, any headway against those, against is probably not the right word. What, what are, let's just talk about a few things that people can do, um, just really practical things to stop that pollution. I mean, I use, I use little, all kinds of little tools to kind of, um, to, to sort of proactively, um, like, I mean, I just use this tool all the time. Good job, Deborah, for picking up my glasses successfully. I'm so proud of me. You know, like, and I do it for little things, like not big things, tiny things, be, so that I can remind myself that every moment, my tongue is working, my lips are working, my my hands are working. I am in this incredible experience and I'm able to experience it. And so it's very helpful for me to, to just, you know, literally like get how amazing it is that I can pick up a pen and connect with that. And that amazing it is that gravity exists and so I'm not flying off into the universe. So that's something that I use proactively. And if at any moment I start going off on my blah, 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 then I will come back and I'll just, I will almost do this sort of um, lightning, lightning round of it. You know, just good job for, for touching, the, touching this table successfully. I'm so proud of me. You know, good job for, oh, good job for noticing that I'm touching the table successfully. I'm really proud of me. Just, I just keep spinning that until I can get out. So that's one of my tools. Um, that I got from a friend of mine. And mm-hmm. what about, what, what is a tool you might suggest? So I think the practice of gratitude, which is a similar to what you're talking about, is one of the best ways to help us stay open to our own, the gifts of our presence and the gifts of our being. The other thing is there's a wonderful book, and I don't recommend a lot of book to my analysis, but this is one I do recommend. Um, the title is Compassion and Self-Hate by Theodore Rubin. Wow. And it's an old book. I mean, it's 40 or 50 years old, but it's been in, it's been in re- reprinted. And I think the question about how do we move and shift this is big enough that getting this book is worth it. Mm-hmm. Because in it, he talks about self-hate and how insidious it is and how it shows up and the mechanisms. Then he talks about compassion and what it looks like and how to cultivate it. Because ultimately that is what we are talking about. We are talking about shifting from self-hate of which criticism and judgment and degrading and demeaning and perfection are an arm of to being able to have compassionate presence recognizing, accepting, acknowledging, and validating wherever we are. And this book talks about it from an emotional, mental, or psychological perspective. Pick up any book by the Dalai Lama who says, my religion is loving kindness, and you'll get, again, a primer on how to cultivate this level of self-compassion. Because until it comes towards us, until we extend it to ourselves, we cannot extend it to anyone else. So, so for anybody out there thinking, oh my God, that would be too self-indulgent. If you aren't able to be compassionate to yourself, you really cannot extend genuine compassion to another person. I believe you. Um, yeah. so what, what, what would be, so we can get that book. So that's one thing yeah. we can do. I get, or get the book by Dalai Lama. Is there any other little tiny Ex, well, I mean, you talked about gratitude. What would be a little time? I mean, every morning I write out five things I'm grateful for. And um, I had a friend recently suggest um, to not just be like, oh, I'm grateful for my cats. I'm grateful for my house. I'm great. But also to be grateful for moments of experience. Mm-hmm. Like, so grateful for that first sip of tea and how it filled my body and what it felt like little tiny things like that and anything else um, aside from sort of just taking the time to to be grateful or is that well yeah i mean i think the bigger backdrop of that is monitoring your self-talk because we all have this running commentary what um the buddhist i call them the buddhist buddhist called the monkey mind i call it the chatterbox you know the chatterbox is constantly going 
My chatterbox is talking to me while I'm talking to you. My chatterbox is talking to me while I listen to you. You know, your chatterbox is talking. And so sometimes we aren't even aware consciously of how much damage the chatterbox is doing. So doing the stream of consciousness journaling, where you just sit down and you start writing, you tune in to what's going on in the back of my, my brain, so to speak, and you just write it because writing it down moves it from here to here and it automatically begins to give us a different perspective on it. And it gives us an energetic sense of being separate from it. And if we're going to do anything different with it, we have to be separate from it. If it's, all in here and we're one and we don't even know it's there it's going to do whatever it wants to with us it's so interesting because you know you and i talk so often about connection mm -hmm. and yet <clears throat> more than once today we've been talking about starting to make that separation but we've also talked about distinction like the first step the first three the change is about awareness um i can't this is it <laughs> Awareness, process, and then relationship. Awareness and then oh, we're just listening. <laughs> Total disawareness. Um, and but this distinction. So sometimes um, you've talked about awareness as the distinction, being able mm -hmm. to tell the distinction between what's in us and what's out of us, or what is us and what is not us. Um, another thing that occurred to me that can help quiet that <clears throat> is and you can do it with music or not with music, is to become aware of all the sensory elements. Mm -hmm. Like right in the moment of when you were talking and talking about the chatterbox mind, I was like, okay, I'm not really listening to everything that Kathleen is saying. And I don't mean just the words, but the sound of her voice, the, you know, the, the special quality of, you know, her, how she accents, how she, you know, phrases, and just the, 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 the physical quality of your voice, the physical quality of your movements and the place that you are. Mm -hmm. And as I start to um, tune into those, I can feel myself get more present. And I noticed, I said this in the, in the class, you know, how to make you know, video um, holiday cards. I, I talk about this, you know, this is the juicy stuff, the stuff that when you get scared. And I talked about just really connecting to the instrument even as you're playing like the minute we start getting like am I playing well did I play all the right notes is this fascinating enough am I just I'm just playing silent night I mean what is that I'm supposed to do that all of that to really connect to every single part of it to, to the feel the feel of the connection. And then what's so beautiful about the harp or any percussion instrument, you play it, you touch it into sound, but then it is singing. Mm -hmm. And there's all that resonance. And, and connecting to that and actually listening. And so to me, the big art of, 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 one big art of playing is to be able to play and listen at the same time to be present and active and still really be listening. Yes, and you said something that I think is important. So let's talk for a minute or two about separation and connection. Because I always say whenever I have time, eventually I'm gonna offer a seminar for married people, married couples that um, the title will be marriage means two, not one. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> the reality is in order for there to be connection, there, have to, there has to be two, which means there has to be separation. And so this idea of distinction so that I have a sense of myself and then I have a sense of this energy field in me that self-hate. That in order for me to connect with the me that's caught in the self-hate, I have to be separate. I have to also have a sense of my separateness from that feeling. Meaning, I realize there's so much more I feel about myself than that moment of self-hate. When I can have that level of separation, I can begin then to connect with the bit of myself that the self-hate has got encapsulated. It's somehow 
protecting in a perverted way. Oh, I see. Right. So that, right. Because the fear and the self-hate, it's not just there to be there. It's there to protect right. the most vulnerable part of us. That's right. Oh, which is why, which is why it, it increases, like what, if somebody, um, you know, makes a face or something like that, that self-hatred will increase. And because it feels like, it's like red blood, blood cells or something. We gotta go there and we gotta, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So I think this idea of separation and connection, and I think if we go circle back to the holiday Christmas card, that, if as you sit down to make your holiday Christmas card, you have a sense of yourself as separate from whomever you're sending the card to, mm -hmm. then chances are you will know intuitively who will really value and appreciate your musical card. Who's gonna just say, oh, there she goes again on some creative jag, and, and who would actually, but still appreciate it, and then who might be critical. And you're gonna know that because you have a sense of who you are and a sense of who they are. Then you can decide how you want to connect with that other separate person. Because part of what sometimes, um, you know, we don't like about getting a generic card that someone else did is just that, it's generic. There's no sense of reaching out to me from where, the, you know, if I sent you a generic card, there would be no sense of, okay, this is where I am reaching to where you are. This is what I know about me. This is what I know about you and our connection. I don't know if I said that well or not. So there's something about, you know, really letting ourselves have that sense of our separateness so that we can truly connect. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm sort of staring, staring at you um, yeah. because I'm thinking, I'm thinking of all the cards that I've gotten um, and I know someone's chosen them and I know that they chose them to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking about what makes them wonderful. And, and I realize that, you know, I have one friend who sends a Christmas card every year of some silly picture of his family and I oh, wait for it. Like, I love it. I actually love getting that card. Um, so uh, there's so much here and I, 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 I wanted to listen to you and I, I forgot what I was saying, which is unimportant. So let's, so let's, so the point is to connect to, to, okay. I know what I was going to say. It was something about how, when you first said this thing about being able to hold up a mirror, that a mirror will give a reflection and it will bring it out of ourselves. You know, it will bring us to be able to see that this is a reflection of someone else and maybe a reflection of something we're responding to, but it is not us. And I also noticed that the, the words you were using, self-hate, were very strong. Mm -hmm. It's a strong concept. So I know we only have like just a couple more minutes and we should probably talk more about this. Is this something that everybody has? Does every... Everybody I've ever met. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think that we all have some degree of self-hate and even if it's very veiled or hidden, and I think hopefully we all have some self-compassion. I think that we all need far more compassion towards ourselves and others. You know, and one of the things since we talked earlier about gratitudes, and I know you have talked about doing this as a morning practice, and I do this sometimes during the evening. In addition to listing five gratitudes, I list five forgivenesses. Right. <laughs> it is really a way to check my own self-hate. Because right. more often than not, the forgivenesses are towards myself. Right. That's yeah. Right. And when they're towards someone else, it's usually because there's something going on for myself I don't like. And it allows me to see that and get to that. So I think that we all need that. And, you know, we don't have time to go into this because, um, you know, we're going to have to stop for today. But the self-hate and compassion are really rooted in those two primary states of destructive and creative energies or what Freud talked about as Thanatos or the death instinct and Eros or the instinct to life and relationship. And so that these are two currents that just flow through us. We see it in our body with anabolism and catabolism and the process of metabolism. Things get torn down, then they get built up. So compassion and self-hate are extensions of those two energies. 
And in truth, we do need destructive energies also, but we need destructive energies to tear down what works against life mm -hmm. versus tearing down life. Mm -hmm. And so the self-hate is kind of a perverted use of the destructive energies that's gotten distorted mm -hmm. and it's errant. And we need consciousness of this because we need access to those energies. So when I want to break a bad habit, I need my destructive energies on board working on my behalf versus unconscious keeping me caught doing the very thing that's harmful. So I know that we have to come to an end in, yeah. in, one, in one minute, but I just want to say that um, we're talking about this because the truth is these things are going to come up when you when we start sharing ourselves. And so what I want to say is as you create, whether it's a video holiday card or it's however you're sharing your, the gift of you, is to really understand that what we're sharing is our love for someone else and separating that from what they might think of us, from what we might be. This is just going into the power, the complete, pure power of our love for someone else, not, not sep you know, take everything else away from it, that love. And that's the thing that we are expressing and sharing. And everything else that happens around it, that's gonna help us be more creative and be more self-aware, but that expression of love opens, uh, opens us and it opens that connection. Yes, absolutely. Kathleen, this was fascinating and I really can't wait to explore a lot of this more and what a perfect time to be talking about this. Absolutely. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs> oh, stop it here. <laughs>